Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. Before we begin, please be aware, we have a tendency to swear. You have been warned, make no mistake, so join us now. We're We're for Fox Fox Sake. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and the blanket-loving Hufflepuff to my left is Carly. I do love a good snuggle. Who doesn't? Well, maybe we can snuggle into our Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 7, The Slug Club, and the not-quite-corresponding film scenes. In the book, we're shopping with the Golden Trio when they run into a bunch of Nazi von douchebags in Madame Malkin's. After making Madame Malkin extremely uncomfortable, Nazi von Douchebag II and his mom decide to leave because Madame Malkin obviously caters to trash, in their words. Unless you're watching the movie, in which they don't even go to Madame Malkin's and just creepily follow Draco into Nocturne Alley and spy on him. After they spy on Draco, the trio returns to Weasley's Wizard Wheezes. The next day, they head back to Hogwarts. In the book... Hermione and Ron are prefects, so they have prefix duties. Harry hangs out with Luna and Neville on the train. Harry's being gawked at more than ever, and Harry and Neville receive an interesting bit of parchment. Unless you're watching the movie, in which case, none of this train stuff happens. During episode 206, Prats and Brats, or Pears and Bears if you're Carly's autocorrect, our Potter pondering was... How do you think the storyline would differ if Voldemort had chosen Neville? Hey, Carly. Hey, Ellen. Jackson here. So we, of course, know that, you know, the story would be very different if Voldemort had chosen Neville because, for one, Snape wouldn't have bothered to ask for the life of Neville's mother. And while I have no doubt that Alice Longbottom would give her life for her son, I don't think it would be the same. I don't think that there'd be the same protection because Lily was given a choice to back away or to still protect her son. I mean, I don't know. Just The magic could still be there for the sacrifice, but I think it was different with Lily. And, of course, you know, Neville would have Harry's life, no parents at all. And uh, he'd have the scar, probably, if he survived. And Harry would have parents, and uh, it would just be such a different story. Hi, this is Jessica calling in my Potter Pondering for this week. How would the story have been different if Voldemort chose Neville? And to be honest, there are so many different routes we could go down by playing the What If game. Really, Harry and Neville's stories are extremely similar. James and Lily died, but Alice and Frank suffered a fate worse than death. Raised by relatives, and while Harry's life with the Dursleys was definitely worse than Neville's was with his gran, you could still make the argument that she was emotionally abusive with the way she constantly compared him to Frank, but really only expecting the bare minimum from him. Or how they thought he was going to be a squib, you know, etc. Frank and Alice weren't hiding just like Lily and James. You know, I definitely believe that Alice would have sacrificed his, herself to save Neville. You know, if he was with them when Bellatrix, Rodolphus, and old Barts Jr. found them. You know, I don't know. But the big glaring difference in these scenarios is that Snape did not love Alice. And therefore would not have asked Voldemort to spare her so if she cast herself between him and neville would the protection spell have been set in place or would neville have been killed my understanding of how exactly the spell works is very foggy but i unfortunately don't believe that neville would have survived the killing curse just because voldemort would not have even offered alice the option to step aside Of course, I'm sure this would have a domino effect, you know, on Sirius Black going to Azkaban and who would have ended up raising Harry, you know, if we go by James and Lily being exactly swapped with Frank and Alice's story and they'd be the ones to end up in St. Mungo's. But even if Neville did survive, 
I'm sure that he would have been the same Neville raised by his gran, you know, his parents just dead rather than tortured into madness. I feel like deep down they would still be the same as they are, you know, Harry meddled Marie Potter would just be meddling more to save the life of Neville rather than himself, which is still very Gryffindor of him. Overall, I think it'd be a bigger presence of Neville in the story, who maybe gained some courage earlier than the fifth book. And it would be the golden, I don't know, golden quad, I guess, instead of golden trio. But yeah, I think if you exactly swap their stories and what happened to each of them, then no, it's, it's very interesting. But that's all I have to say. All right, bye. You know, this is David. I have never thought about what the story would be like in any kind of detail if Neville had been chosen. I mean, to imagine the dynamic of living with his grandmother instead of Harry uh, living with the Dursleys or who his friends would be, you know, I don't think it would have been Ron and Hermione. So what of the other school characters in the class or her house would have been, wow. I mean, I don't have an answer to the question, but I just want to say that the idea of it, amazing, holy cow, just everything would change differently. And to see if Neville, you know, followed the same growth pattern, you know, maybe he wouldn't be middle or be such a meddler or whatever. Or would Harry have come out and glowed up like Neville did to become the badass that he was at the end of the series? You know, wow, that's so many things to contemplate. What a great pilot, but I don't have an answer. Anyway, okay. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, which compartment does Slughorn ask Harry and Neville to meet him in for lunch? He asked them to meet him in compartment C. Congratulations goes to Kalista White Wolf. Yay! This is three weeks in a row. Her streak's going really well, and she said hopefully she can keep it up. She's been thwarted more than Voldy at this point. So what do you think? Is she going to keep it up? You never know. For now, let's dive into the second half of Chapter 7, The Slug Club and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 7, The Slug Club Part 2. Confused, Harry and Neville accept the parchment and unroll them. Ron asks what it is, and Harry lets him know that they are invitations from Professor Slughorn, inviting them to join him for lunch. Neville asks who Professor Slughorn is, and wonders why he wants him to lunch. Harry says he has no idea, even though he does, but then suggests they go under the invisibility cloak so he can spy on Malfoy along the way. This doesn't work out since the corridors are so packed with people that he wouldn't be able to avoid them under the cloak. Harry puts it back in his bag and wishes he could wear it, as people keep darting out of their compartments to get a better look at him. The only exception is Cho Chang, who goes back into her compartment when she sees him coming. As Harry passes her, she is determinately talking to Marietta, who's wearing a very thick layer of makeup that doesn't quite cover up her odd pimples. When they reach compartment C, Harry and Neville find they aren't Slughorn's only invitees but Harry does seem to be the most warmly anticipated. Slughorn acknowledges Neville and gestures for them to sit down. Harry looks around and sees Ginny sitting among several other students he doesn't really know. Slughorn then makes introductions, starting with a Slytherin boy in their year, Blaze Zabini. He then introduces Cormac McLaggen and Marcus Belby before pointing out Ginny and mentioning that she says she knows him. Ginny grimaces at Harry and Neville behind Slughorn's back, and Slughorn settles in his own seat, saying it is pleasant to have a chance to get to know them all better. He passes around napkins and mentions that he packed his own lunch, since the sweets on the trolley aren't great for an old man's digestive system. He offers pheasant to Belby and tells the rest of the group that he had been telling Marcus that he had been his Uncle Damocles' teacher, calling him an outstanding wizard with a well-deserved Order of Merlin. He then asks Marcus if he sees much of his uncle, but Marcus had just taken a huge bite of pheasant, which he swallows too quickly and chokes on. Slughorn uses the spell Anapneo to clear Marcus's airway, allowing him to gasp out that he doesn't, since his dad and him don't get on well. Slughorn gives him a cold smile and turns to McLagan instead, 
telling him that he knows he sees a lot of his uncle Tiberius because he's seen the picture of them hunting nogtails in Norfolk. McLagan says that was fun, mentioning they went with Bertie Higgs and Rufus Scrimgeour before he became the minister. Slughorn is pleased to hear that Cormac knows Bertie and Scrimgeour as well and offers everyone a tray of small pies, though Belby is missed out. Just as Harry expected, everyone present is connected to someone well-known or influential, except Ginny. After McLagan, Slughorn questions the beanie, who is a famously beautiful witch for a mother. Neville's turn is very uncomfortable since his or parents were tortured into insanity by Bellatrix Lestrange and some other Death Eaters. Harry also gets the impression that Slughorn is reserving judgment on Neville. When it's Harry's turn, Slughorn puts off the air of introducing his star act, wondering where to begin, then bringing up how they are calling him the Chosen One now. Harry doesn't respond as Belby, McLagan, and Zabini are all staring at him. Slughorn then brings up the rumors that Harry has powers beyond the ordinary to have survived, and this prompts Zabini to give a skeptical cough. Ginny glares at Zabini and sarcastically mentions that he's so talented at posing. Slughorn chuckles and warns Blaze not to cross her since he saw her do the most marvelous bat bogey hex as he was passing her carriage. He then turns his attention back to Harry, now bringing up the rumors from over the summer about the disturbance at the ministry that put Harry right in the thick of it. Harry merely nods, and Slughorn smiles at this modest confirmation, then asks him about the prophecy. Neville speaks up, turning pink, to inform Slughorn that they never heard a prophecy, and Ginny seconds this, saying they were both there too, and all the chosen one rubbish is just the prophet making stuff up. Slughorn is very interested to learn that Neville and Ginny were both there and does agree that the prophet often exaggerates. He launches into a story about the captain of the Hollyhead Harpies, Gwynog Jones, though Harry is sure Slughorn was not convinced by Ginny and Neville. The afternoon continues on with more stories about the well-known witches and wizards Slughorn had taught that were delighted to join his slug club. Harry cannot wait to leave but also can't figure out how to do so politely until Slughorn realizes it has gotten late and they need to change into their robes. He tells McLagan to drop by and borrow a book on Nogtails, and also invites Harry, Blaze, and Ginny to drop by any time before sending them off. Zabini shoots Harry a filthy look as he pushes past him. Harry, Ginny, and Neville follow the Slytherin down the corridor and discuss how odd Slughorn is and how Ginny ended up there. She explains that he saw her hex, Zachariah Smith, who wouldn't stop asking about what happened at the ministry. She thought she was going to get detention when Slughorn came into the compartment, but instead he said it was a good hex and invited her to lunch. Harry figures this is a better reason than having a famous mother or uncle, but stops when it occurs to him that he can use the beanie as an opportunity to sneak into the sixth year Slytherin's compartment to spy on Malfoy. He tells Neville and Ginny he will see them later and pulls out his invisibility cloak to cover himself before catching up to Zabini and staying as close to him as possible without touching him. He isn't quite quick enough to get through the door before Zabini starts sliding it shut and uses his foot to stop it. Zabini repeatedly smashes the door into Harry's invisible foot, wondering what is wrong with it until Harry pushes it open hard and sends him toppling over. In the ensuing ruckus, Harry leaps onto Zabini's empty seat and hoists himself into the luggage rack. He thinks Malfoy may have noticed his feet as his cloak flapped around him, but Malfoy just lays back down across two seats and puts his head in Pansy Parkinson's lap. Harry just curls up uncomfortably and tries to remain hidden, listening in as Malfoy asks Zabini what Slughorn wanted. Zabini said he was trying to find well-connected people, though he didn't manage to find many. Malfoy isn't pleased as he asks who else he invited. Zabini lists off the attendees, and Malfoy sits up again, shocked to learn he asked Longbottom. He isn't surprised Potter was included, but also wonders what is so special about the Weasley girl. Pansy mentions that a lot of boys like her, gauging the other boys' reactions. Malfoy just lays back in her lap and says he pities Slughorn's taste, mentioning that his father used to be a favorite of his, 
and figuring that Slughorn hadn't heard he was on the train. Zabini tells him not to bank on an invitation because he was asking about Knott's father, who had also been caught at the ministry, and he didn't look happy about it. When he says he doesn't think Slughorn is interested in Death Eaters, Malfoy looks angry, but forces out a humorless laugh as he claims he doesn't care who a stupid teacher is interested in, especially since he might not even be at Hogwarts next year. Pansy asks him what he means, and Malfoy cryptically says he may have moved on to bigger and better things. Harry's heart begins to race as Malfoy's friends all gape at him and wonder if he means him. Malfoy shrugs, saying his mother wants him to finish his education, but he doesn't see the importance. The Dark Lord isn't going to care about OWLs or any WTs when he takes over. Zabini asks him if he really thinks he'll be able to do something for him, and Malfoy cryptically responds that maybe the job he wants him to do isn't something you need to be qualified for. He then points out Hogwarts and says they should change into their robes. Harry is so busy staring at Malfoy that he doesn't notice Goyle reaching for his trunk. It ends up hitting Harry in the head, causing him to gasp in pain and Malfoy to frown up at the luggage rack. Harry isn't really scared, but doesn't want to be discovered hiding in a group of unfriendly Slytherin's train compartment. He slides his wand out and waits, though it seems Malfoy has decided he had imagined the noise. As the train slows to a stop and the corridors begin filling, Malfoy tells Pansy to go ahead because he wants to check something. Excited, Harry's heart starts pounding again as he thinks he's going to get a glimpse of the mysterious object Malfoy wants repaired. Instead, Malfoy hits Harry with Petrificus Totalis. Completely frozen, Harry topples out of the luggage rack and falls at Malfoy's feet. Malfoy smirks, saying he thought so, since he heard Goyle's trunk hit him and thought he saw something flash through the air when Zabini came back. He tells the paralyzed Harry that he didn't hear anything he cared about, but then stamps on Harry's face, hard, and breaks his nose, telling him that's from his father. He then covers Harry completely with his invisibility cloak and tells him he doesn't think they'll find him until the train is back in London. He then says he'll see him around, or not, and deliberately steps on his fingers as he leaves. The movie section starts as Harry makes his way past other train compartments. He holds his rolled up cloak behind his back and the camera cuts to a transition shot outside the train. It shifts back inside the train where Harry is watching Draco from around the doorway. He looks down at his hand where he's holding a piece of Peruvian darkness powder that he got from the twins, then back up at Draco. The camera shows another shot outside the train as a black cloud quickly spreads through the train car and the passengers all gasp. Back inside the train, the darkness is starting to dissipate as everyone is muttering. Draco is standing in the train aisle, looking around and asking what that was. A girl tells everyone to relax, figuring someone was just messing around, then tells Draco to come sit down since they'll be at Hogwarts soon. He sits down in the seat diagonal from the girl and across from another boy. He begins to call Hogwarts a pathetic excuse for a school and says he thinks he'd pitch himself off the astronomy tower if he thought he'd had to continue there for another two years. The girl asks him what that's supposed to mean, and Malfoy just cryptically says they won't see him wasting his time in charms class next year. The boy sniggers, and Malfoy asks if he's amused, calling him Blaze, and telling him they'll see who's laughing in the end. He then looks up at the luggage rack, where a bag appears to be slightly shifting on its own, before the scene cuts to show the train arriving at Hogsmeade Station. It's dark out, and Hagrid is standing on the platform with Fang and a lantern. He watches as the train comes to a stop and the camera cuts back to Malfoy as he tells Blaze and the girl to go on, since he wants to check on something. As Hermione and Ron exit their compartment, Hermione wonders where Harry is, but Ron isn't concerned, figuring he's already on the platform and leads the way off the train. As everyone continues to make their way to the platform, Draco slowly stands and walks towards the train car door. Instead of leaving, he slides the door shut and pulls the shade down. Another exterior shot of the train shows all the shades in the car lowering on their own before cutting back to Malfoy, who is still facing the train car door. He asks Potter if Mummy didn't tell him it was rude to eavesdrop before turning and casting Petrificus Totalis without warning. Still under his invisibility cloak, 
Harry falls from the luggage rack, frozen in the aisle of the train car. Draco steps towards him and pulls the cloak off, revealing Harry lying on his back, unable to move as he stares up at a sneering Malfoy, who continues taunting Harry about his mother being dead. He then stomps on Harry's face and picks the invisibility cloak back up, telling him that was from his father and to enjoy his ride back to London. He covers him with the cloak and exits the train car, closing the door behind him. So we do have some pretty similar things happening in this section. They just, you know, cut out the lunch entirely. Yeah, how you get to this point, definitely different. Indeed. However, once you get to this point, some similarities. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like the lightest wisp. <laughs> Of the end of chapter seven, yes. Just the gist. Part who knows. Yup. But the book chapter, at least this half of it, we pick it back up right after Harry and Neville get their little scrolls inviting them to that lunch that you pointed out was left out of the movie completely. Mm-hmm. It's an invitation from Professor Slughorn. Neville has no idea who this is at this moment. He's like, who? Why am I getting invited? What? I wish Neville had more confidence. I know it's confusing for him probably in the moment, but yeah, still. in this moment. He's Neville Longbottom. There's a professor on the train, which the only time that's ever happened before was with Remus. That's true. I was thinking about that when I was listening to this chapter last night. I was like, it's very odd. <laughs> Is it odd? Because he totally rides on the train so he can find his new slug club members. I think to the students, it's going to be odd. Oh, for sure. Like Remus did it, I assume, because he couldn't afford any other way to travel there. And then Slughorn's doing it to creep on some students, man. Yeah, totally. This is odd. I don't know. <laughs> How would you travel to school? I would totally want to ride on the train. If you were a professor. I would totally want to ride on the train. As long as I had my own compartment, I didn't have to sit with students when the school year hadn't started yet. Well, yeah. I frequently think about this, though, because, like, does McGonagall live at the school? She has a house. She does, yeah. I just, like, do you go there in the summer? Do you go to the beach? You know, that whole scene in Prisoner of Azkaban where Harry's talking about imagining Dumbledore putting sunscreen on his <laughs> nose. Like, does McGonagall go to the beach? Do you enjoy the sun, Minerva? She might. She's a very Scottish soul, though, so she might not. She's a cat too, mm, so cat. she lays maybe in the not sun places beams. with water, but definitely sun. Yeah, you know. But I just am curious. I would probably take a magic carpet if they weren't banned, because that seems like a very comfortable way to travel. Honestly, most of the professors would probably just flu powder there, but the fireplaces aren't always open. But Dumbledore could open it for the start of the year. I guess maybe. That would be dangerous in these dark times. In these dark times. But Slughorn totally wants to ride the train so he can pick his favorites and get to know them. I wonder if there are students who don't ride the train. Because obviously there are students who live in Hogsmeade, I'm sure. Whose huh. Parents like run stuff. Or as you see in Hogwarts Legacy, there's lots of like burrows that are fairly close to Hogwarts, and I'm sure students live in some of those. Yeah, you can take a broom to where Sebastian and his sister live. Mm -hmm. So, just a thought. Thoughts to think. So anyway, they get invited to this lunch, and Harry says he has no idea why Neville's included or why he's being invited, even though he kind of does. But he's just like, I don't know, but brainstorm. Get under the cloak with me. We're going to go spy on Malfoy. I listened to this part last night and I was like, stop getting Neville into your weird conspiracy club. Get out. Come on, Harry. Also, this was like in my brain, not a moment that Harry would share with Neville. But it was nice that he included him like, hey, we're going to both get under the cloak. Well, he didn't really have a choice. Neville was there. I, I mean, Neville's he pretty stubborn. He is. He showed that in the first book when he tried to fight them so they wouldn't leave their common room at night again. I don't know if that was stubbornness or a true Gryffindor trait of bravery. Are we going to pretend like stubbornness isn't part of that? <laughs> well, stubbornness is part of that. That is true. But they he showed it again car. in the fifth book when he was like, no, we're going with you. Like, What was the point of all of this? I guess that's also DA stuff. loyalty. It's both, but... 
definitely like he's like no we are part of this now like you've been training us what else was the point if it wasn't to do this so there's no way harry knows this he's not smart but he's not dumb there was no way that he was going to be like you go on without me i'm going to get under this cloak and spy on malfoy on my way i also just said i didn't know what neville's sign was his sign is a leo so this all makes sense oh yeah because harry's is too they're one day apart yeah unfortunately they don't get to do that it's too crowded. Yeah, there's too many people in the corridors. So there was no way that A, they could have even gotten the cloak out and put it on without people noticing. And B, there's no way they could have navigated the sea of people without bumping into some of them and have them be like, what the fuck was that? The train's but haunted. Ah! The train is haunted if you've read Cursed Child. Well, there's that too. <laughs> we just don't know it. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> However, Harry does wish that he could be wearing the cloak because just the mere act of walking down the corridor has people darting out of their compartments just to stare at him. Except Cho. Except Cho and Marietta. Well, you know. Which could be a combo of also not wanting to put her heavily makeuped face not quite covering her sneak pimples. She could have been like Regina George and started a new trend and just wore like a... I don't know. Balaclava? <laughs> Maybe her balaclava again, yes. I don't think she's popular enough for that. Ginny might be able to start that trend. Ginny also wouldn't have sneak pimples across her face. I hope at some point, if Marietta shows that she's not quite a sneak, it starts to go away. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. It's a little rough to have for your whole life. That would suck. We've talked about that so many times. Mm -hmm. I still do like to believe that when she shows true loyalty, it fades it. Yeah, that's fair. Anyway, Harry and Neville get to compartment C and see that they're not the only ones Slughorn invited. There's quite a few other people in there. Harry does seem to be the most anticipated being the chosen one, as Slughorn will later acknowledge. But... He invites them in, has them sit down, and Harry looks around and is surprised to see that Ginny Weasley is also there. I love that she gets included. I love that this shows how different she is from her brothers, how talented she is on her own. Yep. And I love the story as to why she got invited, which we'll get to. Most of the other students there, Harry doesn't know. Like, he kind of recognizes some of them. There's a Slytherin boy who's in the same year as him, which is Blaze Zabini. There's a slight aside to Blaze in the movie where Draco literally says, something funny, Blaze. Yeah. That's all we get. (laughs) He's there, but he's not, like, really important. I'm not sure this is fully important, but we do learn a little bit more about him than just getting a mention in the movie. But then there's the handsome Cormac McLaggen. Yeah, and this is the first time that we really get to meet him. We've actually seen him in the movie, though we don't know that yet. Also, Marcus Belby. What house is Marcus in, I wonder? I think he's Hufflepuff. Was he wearing yellow in the movie? I thought he was wearing blue in the movie, but I might be When we get to that point, because we do actually meet him, but he's eating all of the food. (laughs) <laughs> Which is probably why my brain is saying Hufflepuff. But yeah. since we do this like a section at a time, we haven't gone to verify that as you bring it Not up. But yet. We'll come back to it. He's different in the book than but he yeah. is in the movie. Yeah. So Slughorn's introducing Cormac McLaggen, who is Gryffindor, and Marcus Belby, who is at this point unknown to us. If you all know, let us know. Then he points out Ginny. And says, this charming young lady says she knows you. And Ginny's just behind him like, "Uh uh-huh. The amount of times Ginny grimaces in this book is astounding. And it's normally at Harry. Yes, it is. I love it. She's doing all of the communicating with her eyes and her face whenever something cringy is happening and Mm -hmm. Harry and Ginny are in the same room or compartment at this point. So anyway, at this point, he's introduced everybody. They're all getting settled in their seats. And Slughorn's just like, it's so nice to have a chance to get to know you all better. 
I've packed my own lunch to share with you because sweets aren't great for an old man's digestive system. And then he starts offering food to them all. Starting with Marcus Belby, it says that he offers him what looks like half of a cold pheasant. And he literally takes it. Yeah. That's me. I'm not going to be rude and be like, no, <laughs> he's probably a Hufflepuff. I'm telling you, that's what my brain is saying. He's trying to not be rude. And he's like, oh, God, I take it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in the movie, they had him eating everything. But that ice cream looked like the bomb diggity. Really I would have also been eating it like yeah. that. He explains to the rest of the group that he'd been telling Marcus how he had taught his uncle Damocles and says that he was an outstanding wizard with a well-deserved order of Merlin. Yeah, so this is when we're really starting to see why he's invited the people that he's invited. In this case, Belby has a sort of famous uncle, a talented, outstanding wizard of an uncle, And he asks him if he sees much of them. And Marcus has taken a huge bite of this pheasant, tries to swallow it quickly to answer, and ends up just choking on it. Yeah, he's a Hufflepuff. (laughs) Sorry. That's how we are. And Slughorn uses anapneo to clear his airway. Can we talk about how I need that? I'm so scared that my son's going to choke on something. (laughs) I'm just like, if I could just wave a wand and make sure he didn't choke, that would be great. Super handy. For anyone, really. Not For just, anyone, not no. even just kids, but particularly. But once his airways cleared, although that would still be rather traumatizing, he yes. manages to gasp out that he doesn't see his uncle very often because his dad does not get on very well with him. So it's kind of like a, oh. I don't like this, that... Maybe his uncle has a big head and is not very kind to his dad. You never know. We don't know the reasons. But because of that, like, because they don't talk, they don't have a connection. Slughorn's like, and moving on. Yeah. Even though Marcus could have all of his uncle's intelligence. He could. And probably his dad's. His dad's probably smart, too. Just didn't come up with the Wolfsbane potion. Yeah. Well, his dad was never in the slug club. Probably not, because he doesn't mention it. And the fact that his dad is not close with the uncle was apparently an off switch for Slughorn. I don't know why, but it was. They specifically say that he moves on to talk to McLagan and mentions that he knows he sees a lot of his uncle Tiberius because he's seen the picture of them hunting nogtails in Norfolk. That's a mouthful. Nogtails in Norfolk. Yeah. And McLagan says how fun that was. Also mentioning they went with Bertie Higgs and Rufus Scrimgeour, though this was before he became the minister. So McLagan knows how to play this game. I was going to say, he's exactly the type of person that Slughorn wants in his club. Oh, yeah. He's very pleased when he realizes that Cormac knows both Bertie and Rufus. Just a mess. He then starts handing pies out to everyone and somehow misses giving them to Marcus Belby. Somehow. Give the boy a dessert. He He obviously wants it. He's probably Hufflepuff. (laughs) (laughs) He is a rather skinny boy described in the book. So maybe he doesn't, but still, like, come on, that's not nice. It just says small pies. They aren't necessarily dessert pies. They literally could be meat pies or something, but still. I'm really hungry. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Anyway, Harry is starting to pick up on what we've already mentioned, that everyone present is connected to someone well-known or influential, with the exception of Ginny. She just is exceptional and influential. Yep. And will soon be well-known. That's true. That's true. Maybe not soon, but will be well-known. I mean, like, four years, probably. Do you think that Slughorn was literally like, oh, I knew her back when. And Ginny's just like, no, you didn't. (laughs) I feel like maybe in her sixth year, I feel like Slughorn probably stops being such a, he, he gets the moment. He gets the redemption moment. McGonagall's like, it's time for you to choose a side. Like, pick a side. You don't get to be Switzerland anymore. And he picked it. And he chose right. He did. I'll give him that. And I think that that probably stands out to Jenny 
Louise even though Lee's it took in general. Yeah, it took him a while. I mean, it took Percy a while too, but they welcome him back with open arms. Because it's easier to forgive someone for being wrong than it is to forgive them for being right. Correct. So says Dumbledore. So Belby knows his uncle that he doesn't really have, seem to have a connection with, but McWagon has a famous uncle or a well known uncle. Then you have Zabini, Blaze the Beanie, who has a famously beautiful witch for a mother. Is that literally what she's famous for? For being beautiful? She's famous for being beautiful and for having multiple husbands who all died mysteriously, leaving her with a lot of money. Being a black widow? Okay. Yeah. So, but it's really just, she's so beautiful. I mean, Blaze in the movies was very attractive, so. He's described as being attractive in the books, too. Yeah. And this is the part that I hate the most. Yeah. Because it's stupid. Obviously, we already know what Neville's connection is, why Slughorn wanted him there. But it's a very uncomfortable interview that he basically has with Slughorn because... Does he tell them? I don't think so. It just says that it's very uncomfortable. I'm sure that he brings up knowing his parents and how they were such great horrors and... Neville's just sitting there like, yeah, now they're absolutely insane thanks to Bellatrix Lestrange and some other murder munchers, and they are they don't know who I am. They're just in St. Mungo's for the rest of their lives. They do know who he is. I'm sure that that's how he feels, though. I think that they do, especially the way his mom gives him the gum wrapper. The gum wrapper. She knows. She doesn't know how to give him a real gift. She's like, this is shiny. Take yeah. it. You're my baby. But... That's still not a solid connection there. That's not great for Neville. That's tough. It's not. And I really think that this is a very inappropriate way to kind of out Neville's life to these people. And he doesn't like necessarily say it because we're like in Harry's head at this point and he's thinking about all the stuff. So we don't really hear the conversation. Yeah, I'm positive that none of the details really got out. It was probably a lot of like awkward long pauses and like, yeah, those are my parents and stuff like that. I don't know. Like you said, though, we don't get it. We don't get the conversation. We just get Harry's commentary on said conversation. And he also thinks that Slughorn is reserving judgment on Neville. So Neville has not been fully cast aside like Belby was, but he has not seemed to be like, you definitely have the talents that your parents had. I'm so excited to have you in my club. What talents is he looking for? Because honestly, Neville's talent as a herbologist is high. He's a very oh, good herbologist. Absolutely, but he's looking for things. And by he, I mean Sluggy mm-hmm. is looking for things that will take them far enough to continue on Slughorn's own giant spider web of connections. But that definitely has some advantages because you can help people with potions. True. But and, he doesn't know that at this well, point. He's either. been a turd, which is unfortunate because no, you could be a really good teacher. He's kind of just a turd though. <laughs> like turds can be good teachers sometimes. Eh, just, you know, Anyway, we get to Harry's turn. (laughs) And he thinks that Slughorn is kind of acting like this is his star act. (laughs) Saved him for last. And finally. Totally just flat out calls him the chosen one. And Harry's just sitting there. He's like, I do not have anything to say to this. I don't know why I have to do this. This is super awkward. I am the chosen one, but I don't want to tell you that, I'm sure. So he just doesn't say anything. He just sits there, and Belby, McLagan, and Zabini just all stare at him. Slughorn also mentions the rumors that Harry has these, like, super extra magical powers, and that's why he was able to survive. And Zabini kind of, (coughs) like, laugh coughs about this one. Yeah. And then Ginny gets sassy. And Ginny gets sassy. And tells him that, oh, yeah, because you're so talented at posing. This kills me. This makes Slughorn laugh. And he gives Blaze a little bit of a warning, like, 
you probably don't want to get on her bad side because I saw her do the most marvelous bat bogey hex when I was passing her <laughs> carriage. I love that that's why he brought her in. I know. It's, it's such so a good. cute little story. Yeah. I hope that her and Slughorn ended up having a good relationship. Yeah. I don't never think Jenny know. cares about shit like that. I don't think she does either. Like, she doesn't care necessarily about connections and stuff like that. But she does go to every slug club meeting. Yeah. So maybe Probably because she's hoping to see Harry secretly. Or Gwynog Jones. That's possible, too. But this is not enough to distract Slughorn from his star act. And he shifts back over to Harry. Now mentioning the rumors that cropped up over the summer about their little adventure at the ministry with Harry right there in the <laughs> thick of it. And Harry's just like, yeah. He just sort of nods, which Slughorn seems pleased that Harry does confirm this happened, but is also kind of modest about it. Like, Harry's not bragging. I don't think that I would want to brag about this particular scenario either because this is where my godfather died. This was not like a braggable event to Harry in his well, main. Yeah. In his I don't mind. just mean this particular event, though. He's in always general, modest. Yeah. He's not saying anything about anything Slughorn's bringing up. No. And then you got Cormac McLaggen, who's just like, oh, well, I also know the minister. And la, 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 la. And yeah. Harry's just like, I give you a nod. Because that's what you deserve. Slughorn then asks about the prophecy which is what everyone really wants to know about since it's been published in the Daily Prophet. We didn't hear a prophecy. Yeah. Sweet Neville. I love Neville's like embarrassed to do so, but also does speak up. He's still doing the bravery thing. Yeah. You do it, baby. Says that they never heard a prophecy. And Ginny's like, yeah, we were both there too. And this chosen one rubbish is just stuff the prophet's making up. Uh, is it though? Ma'am. <laughs> At this point, I think Ginny might kind of believe that not because she actually believes that but because she hopes that i actually think she doesn't want it to be true that's what i'm saying like oh, okay. she hopes that he is not the chosen one and the prophet is just making that all up because she doesn't want it to be true i wouldn't want to be i no, the person you're in love with you don't want it to be yeah like they don't know what was in the prophecy but if you're a quote the chosen one to get rid of the dark lord that probably means that you're not going to be able to have a girlfriend or a wife or ultimately accept pretty well she does but it's but not easy always has the flame for harry yep anyway this becomes enough to sort of distract slughorn because now he's like oh you two were there too Ugh. <laughs> and he does agree that the prophet exaggerates things sometimes so he actually shares a story about gwinog jones captain of the hollyhead harpies mentioning something along those lines as well so he concedes at the moment but harry is also like i don't think they actually convinced him that i'm not the chosen one harry in the books versus harry in the movies and how he reacts to slughorn i feel like they are complete opposites yeah well in the books harry is like this is unwanted attention i don't like it Whereas at this point in the movie already, Dumbledore has told him that Slughorn's going to want to collect, collect him, him and he wants him to let him. Mm -hmm. So he does treat it a lot differently. It's an interesting change. Most likely to just move the plot along, but move the plot forward. But they end up spending the rest of the afternoon in the compartment, compartment C. The trivia question. Yeah. With Slughorn. As he just tells more and more stories of all the well-known witches and wizards that he's taught over the years. And how they were so delighted to be part of his slug club. And Harry's just like, I'm not. Can I leave now? How do I do this politely? It literally takes until it starts to get dark. And Slughorn realizes how late it's gotten and that they need to go change into their robes to let them leave. He tells McLagan that he should drop by and borrow a book on Nocktails from him. So at this point, even though Harry is the star, McLagan is probably a second place. Ugh. But how do you compete with Harry fucking Potter? Oh, he tries. Harry James meddling Marie Potter. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. 
But he does tell Harry, Blaze, and Ginny to drop by any time. So <laughs> leaving out Belby and he Neville. Out Belby and Neville. But like I said, he's done with Belby. Like he just wrote him off. Neville, he wants to see him in action. Zabini being Slytherin, and therefore Harry's natural enemy, <laughs> gives Harry a filthy look and just pushes right past him. And this just leaves Harry, Ginny, and Neville to kind of follow him and make their way down the corridor and discuss how strange that was. And Harry's like, how did you end up there? And Ginny's like, well, Zachariah Smith would not stop bugging me about what happened at the ministry. He's so the worst. <laughs> I hexed him with a bat bogey hex and Slughorn caught me. I thought he was going to give me detention, but instead he said it was a really good hex and he invited me to lunch. Must have been some hell of a hex, I'll say that. It's not the first time that it's mentioned that's what she's known for, so. She's good at magic. She had to be good at magic to ward her brothers off of picking on her. Accurate. Harry thinks showing aptitude for a hex is a better reason to be invited than having a famous mother or uncle. But he kind of trails off on this line of thinking when it occurs to him that this is the opportunity to do some fucking meddling. As per usual. He tells Neville and Ginny he'll see them later, pulls out his invisibility cloak, and covers himself before catching up to Zabini and staying as close to him as possible without actually touching him. Because he doesn't want to get caught. This is not the moment you want to get caught, as he learns later. Mm -mm. So he stays as close to him as he can, but he's not quite quick enough to get through the door into the Slytherin compartment where Malfoy is hanging out. And he has to stick his foot out to stop it from shutting. So now the compartment door is sliding into Harry's foot. And Zabini's like, what the fuck is going on with this door? And Harry just grabs it and pushes it open as hard as he can. And since Zabini is still hanging onto the handle, he just goes flying toppling over into Goyle's lap, essentially. <laughs> this naturally creates quite the ruckus, and Harry uses this opportunity to jump up onto the seat Zabini would have been occupying had he not been giving Goyle a lap dance. <laughs> but he hops onto his seat and hoists himself up into the luggage rack. He's a little bit concerned because he thinks he saw Malfoy's eyes notice his feet as they were flying through the air because there's nothing covering it from under the cloak. But Nazi von Duschbeck II then just kind of goes back to his, the whole conversation of what's going on and all of the ruckus. And so he thinks he's in the clear. Weary about the cloak. If Harry is crouching in the luggage rack, I feel like if somebody looked up, they could just see Harry, right? Well, I'm sure that he could tuck it under him. I don't know. Maybe we could uh, ask our keepers. What do you think? I mean, this is a cloak that is big enough to still fit three people, three people under it. At least mostly. I imagine it really drags on the ground. When it's just one of when them. When it's just yeah. one of them. And I think that like when he is flying up through the air, it would flare open because mm -hmm. it just was the little bit of his feet, the mm -hmm. white he of his just shoes that he saw. Bottom of his trainers, yeah. So once he got up, he could have just like grabbed the folds of it and tucked it under him. And it says he curls up yeah. in the luggage rack. So what a cutie. Until he gets smacked in the head. I don't yeah. know. Just a curiosity. What are the faults of the there aren't any faults. Like it's that's supposed a big to be impenetrable. Yeah. So unless you catch them from underneath, bum, 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 make it into a onesie. <laughs> it just says that he curls up, it's uncomfortable, and he does what he can to remain hidden. So I'm sure he's up there and just counting on everybody being distracted by mm -hmm. the confusion that's going on below from what happened with the door and everybody yeah. freaking out over Blaze being in Goyle's lap. and A Goyle lap dance. Bum, bum, bum. Once things kind of settle down, Malfoy asks Blaze what Slughorn wanted because nobody really knew it was just come to lunch. So Zabini tells him that he was trying to meet the well-connected people, which is literally what he was doing, says he didn't manage to find many, and Nancy von Douchebag is not pleased by this because he still 
fancies himself as a well-connected people. Yeah, but that whole jail thing going on. Yeah, times are a-changing, bud. He asks who else was invited, and at the mention of Longbottom, he he sits up. He had previously been laying his head in Pansy Parkinson's lap, so he was taking up multiple seats. Yeah, because, you know, Nazi von douchebag. <laughs> yeah. But he sits up like, what the fuck's Longbottom doing there? Says he isn't surprised that Potter was included, but also wonders what's so special about the Weasley girl. <laughs> Pansy says, well, a lot of boys like her. Oh, Pansy. And you can just see. She's gauging. I mean, the book says she's gauging, but like she is testing them. It's like, how are you going to react to this when I say? The author makes it seem like she's the only girl in her and Millicent Bulstrode are the only girls in Slytherin. I think there are more. They just don't matter to the story. I guess. Whatever. It's just funny because Pansy's the only one who really gets mentioned as ever spending time with Malfoy. And then he doesn't even marry her. Why would he? She is kind of a trash can. Kind of? A lot of. (laughs) None of the boys are like, yeah, whatever. I guess she's pretty. and But Blaze. Pansy is just like, even you think she's pretty and we all know how hard you are to please. <laughs> and Blaze flat out says that he wouldn't touch that pure blood traitor with a 10-foot pole or whatever. Like, I don't remember exactly how he worded it. That doesn't mean she's not attractive, Blaze. But he thinks she's pretty. <laughs> anyway, Malfoy just lays back down in her lap. He is unimpressed. Talks about how he pities Slughorn's taste. And like I said, he's still kind of stuck in the time when his dad was influential and not in prison. (laughs) Says that his father used to be a favorite of Slughorn's and that Slughorn must not have heard he was on the train. Wishful thinking. Zabini says, yeah, don't expect an invitation. He was asking about Knott's father, who was also one that was caught at the ministry. Didn't look happy about it. I think it's interesting that he wasn't asking Zabini about Lucius Malfoy. I feel like he knew that one, but he wasn't sure about Knott's father. So maybe he was asking Zabini about that. But Avery Knott didn't get an invitation either. I also think it's weird that Slughorn somehow had all of these little Death Eater, budding Death Eaters as his slug club. Well, a lot of those budding Death Eaters were Slytherins who are very ambitious and therefore present that persona of being someone who's going to climb up the ladder and build his connections out so he can have that awesome little spider web of popularity. Ugh. Blaze flat out says that he doesn't think Slughorn is interested in murder munchers. Which kind of pisses Malfoy off, understandably, but he kind of pretends like it doesn't. He just sort of... he tosses it under the bus and is like, it's fine. Gives a little laugh and says he doesn't care who a stupid teacher's interested in. And mentions that he might not even be at Hogwarts next year. Which is what he says in the movie, similarly, but... Ish. (laughs) More like, ugh, I don't want to do charms. To which I say, it's probably because you didn't pass your charms, O-W-L. I I think it's interesting because then Pansy asks him what he means. So we do have some specific similarities here. But they're not in a compartment. They're in a full open train car. This is not a private, private conversation like the way they did it in the book. In the movie, they made it feel like everyone who was in the train car with them was a Slytherin. So... Draco was just like, it's fine. Yeah. Which I think he would have been like, it's fine regardless. Probably. (laughs) But it really was just Pansy and Blaze and Malfoy in the movie. We didn't have Crab and Goyle there, too. Was this the movie that the guy that played Crab had gotten arrested and so he couldn't play? Maybe. I don't know. But I did think it was weird that they didn't include Goyle. But yeah. Frustrating. Hopefully there's more consistency in the TV show. I sure hope so. But like I was saying, Pansy's like, what does that mean? Because at least that part of the conversation is fairly accurate. 
And Malfoy says that he may have moved on to bigger and better things. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, bigger, eh, better, eh. <laughs> Now, this is exactly what Harry was hoping he would get to over here. So he's like, adrenaline, oh, like this is the best. This is Harry's bread and butter right here. Meddling. Malfoy's friends are all like, do you mean him? <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah, but his mom wants him to finish his education. He just doesn't really see the importance, and he's just kind of like, eh. The Dark Lord's not going to care about OWLs or any WTs when he takes over. So, yeah, he might move on to bigger and better things. Zabini's like, do you really think you're going to be able to do something for him? And Malfoy says that maybe the job he wants me to do isn't something you need to be qualified for. <laughs> that should really tell you something. I need no qualifications for this job whatsoever. I don't need to be a qualified wizard to murder someone. Yahoo! Woo! At this point, they can see Hogwarts out the window, so he says that they should probably change into their robes. And Harry is so busy trying to read Malfoy's mind that he doesn't realize that Goyle is reaching for his trunk. And as he grabs it, it hits Harry in the head hard enough to cause him to do an audible gasp. Which, unintentional, but still enough to be heard. Again, there's a very good possibility Nazi von Douchebag II notices something because he looks up and frowns at the luggage rack. Harry's not really scared by this. No. But he also doesn't want them to find him. Like, it's not going to be good, necessarily. Good for no one. But he, he's definitely faced way worse. So he pulls his wand out and just holds it under his robes so he can be ready just in case. Damn it, I hit the thing. So he pulls his wand out and just holds it under his robes so he can be ready just in case. But Malfoy just goes right back to getting ready for school. And it appears as though he decided he imagined the sound. Well, that's the plan, Stan. Yep. The train starts to slow down and... When it stops completely, everybody exits their compartments into the corridor. They start to make their way off the train. But Nazi von Douchebag II tells Pansy to go ahead because he wants to check something. Which is exactly what he says in the movie. Yeah, so woo, ding! Ding for one line. Yes! Harry, not being a Ravenclaw, is excited by this. Such a dum dumb in this moment. He thinks he's going to get a glimpse of this mystery object that Malfoy was asking Borgen about fixing. But no. No. Instead, without warning, he just says Petrificus Totalis and freezes Harry in the luggage rack. Because of the awkward position he was in, I imagine, Ugh. he just topples right out of it and lands on the floor. But he lands right at Nazi von Douchebag's feet. Yikes. And, you know, VD2 says, yeah, I thought so. I heard Goyle's trunk hit you. And I thought I saw something flash through the air when Zabini first came back. So he did, in fact, notice him both times. And Harry, not being Ravenclaw, still took the risk. So dumb. So dumb. Nazi von Douchebag tells Harry that he didn't hear anything he actually cared about. I honestly think he said what he said more to taunt Harry. Yeah. Didn't give any details, but... Didn't say anything he would have regretted him hearing. But to really just peek the meddling bone in his body. <laughs> which I'm pretty sure is all of them. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but being the Nazi von Douchebag that he is, like I said... He stamps on Harry's face really hard and just breaks his nose. Burst. I have broken my nose before, and I can't, like, just reading that makes me cringe. I can imagine that it doesn't feel like I'm, like, twitching my nose right now thinking about it, but I can imagine it does not feel very good. No, it doesn't. It's pretty awful. And Blood, you can't do anything. Guys. You can't even, like, make a noise. 
like you're literally frozen. For yeah. Sure. So this chapter then ends with Nazi von Duschbag the second recovering Harry with the invisibility cloak, so nobody can see him. He says that I don't think they're going to find you until the train's back in London and says, see you around or not. I have been wanting to talk about this for like four episodes. Why is there not a list where they are checking kids off as they are getting off the train? This is the most irresponsible educational decision I have ever. Why are they not being checked off when they get on the train to make sure that everybody gets on the train and then checking them off when they get off? They are children. I mean, they might be doing that, and Malfoy is just counting on the fact that the train is going to leave. He doesn't know how the system works. He's always off and on. Like, obviously, the train does not leave before Tonks has a chance to check it. Yeah, but they're checking it this year because it's Harry, and she happens to notice that he doesn't get off the train. train. Yeah, It is not something they do. I am so, (laughs) like, as an educator... When you take kids on a field trip, you count those kids every five minutes to make sure that they are with you at all times. You have a checklist of your kids. Like, I have been thinking about this every time I listen to it. I was like, Ellen and I need to talk about this because as educators, you keep up with your kids. Yeah. And like when Harry was saying, when they missed the train in the second one, and McGonagall's like, why the hell did you not send us a letter that you missed the train? I didn't think that's clear. Well, yeah. (laughs) But why didn't you guys have something in place to see that they had missed the train? Well, I think they did because they realized he wasn't there. But what can they do about it? They don't know where he is. I think that they didn't realize it until they're back at school. Maybe. And that really stresses me. (laughs) They're probably relying on the parents. I guess. And like your parents need to make sure their kids make it on the train. We got them when they get here. Okay. I don't know. Sure. (laughs) I don't know. But it's been stressing me out. So I've been thinking about it a lot. <laughs> it's also entirely possible that it's just one of those details the author did not think about. Because she's not an educator. No. Clearly. Clearly. But anyway, Harry gets left on the train under his invisibility cloak and Nazi von Duschbang the second steps on his fingers. Like, makes it a point to step on his fingers as he's So leaving. he must be splayed out like a plank. That would be my thought yeah. process, yeah. Not curled up in a ball. But he had to make note of where those fingers were to before step. he put the cloak over yeah. him. The book specifically says he was careful to step on to his To tread fingers. on his fingers. Yeah, what the... What, what a, a Nazi von douchebag. Indeed. The second. The second. So he's twice as awful. That's not true. His dad's twice as awful. Generation two of awful. That's well, true. we could be way... There could be way more. He might be the 12th for all we know. Nazi von douchebag, the next generation. (laughs) (laughs) So the movie hits on some of this. Like we said, they leave out the whole lunch. Because why would you include a lunch? Well, they do kind of include it later. Eventually, but it's weird. So we'll tie it back into this moment when we get to that. In the movie and in the book, Harry's just being shifty as fuck. And he's always just like, I'm going to catch Draco in a lie. Draco, Draco. Draco." It's it's very, very uh, one-track mind for Harry. Definitely doesn't have ADHD, that boy. Not when it comes to meddling. Yeah, he's uh, got some meddling bones. He's forever the meddler, which is like a peddler, but you meddle in peddling your meddling skills. It's a lot. It's a Harry Potter in the medley of meddling. It is true. But he takes the darkness powder just like we saw him get in the movie. He grabs it, which would have been a lot better of an idea. Right? I think it's interesting that they had him use the powder instead of the cloak. He uses both. He does use the cloak, but in the book, he just puts on the cloak and follows him. Yeah. Like, he was hidden around the corner. Nobody could see him. Why not just put on your cloak and walk to the luggage rack above them and... Hope nobody knows. Or maybe do the powder then. I guess they may it have been able to, to tell be the where it was supposed to be the distraction. From. Yeah, I don't know. It seemed in the movie. It seemed like they were using it as, oh, that's a distraction, so it Harry did could cause get time an uproar. to get in the luggage. But how rack. would he have been able to see what luggage rack to go climb into and shit like that? 
Yeah, yeah. The people freaked out and like got up and were in the middle of the aisle. So how did he yeah. walk down there? Like it was dumb. I didn't like it. I'm just saying. <laughs> I didn't like it. But he does use it. So that's cool. It's a little throwback to the to Weasleys. I liked how they showed it too, where they switched to the outside of the train yeah, and, and just showed, showed the smoke. black smoke yeah. fill it. It was kind of cool. And this gets used later in the book. Draco uses it. Yeah. So this kind of, but it doesn't get used in the movie, but whatever. It's cool that they gave it at least one thing where we could see what was going on. I mean, Harry technically wouldn't be able to see anything in it because that's what it does. Right. So like. It doesn't make sense. Like, how did he get to a luggage compartment and climb up in it and overhear the conversation without them realizing he was there? Correct. You know, you never know. But, you know, sneaky, sneaky. He's being a sneaky snake, and he climbs into the luggage rack above Malfoy and Friends, TM. <laughs> I did put that in my notes, by the way. Malfoy and Friends, TM, yeah. yeah. So Nazi Von Douchebag II is making it fairly clear to who I assume is Pansy, because she's the only girl there, Pansy and Blaze, that he's not going to be at Hogwarts next year. Slight ding. Slight ding. He makes a point to say, you won't see me in charms class next year. And uh, Pansy's like, what? <laughs> what? You haven't told me that. What are you talking about? I'm yeah. your girl. Yeah. We're steady. Give me your cloak. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, after some jibes from Blaze and some worry from Pansy, we see the train stop at Hogsmeade Station just like it does. And then this moment, this whole moment is very similar. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning of this section, it definitely parallels. It tapers it off. It lined yeah. back up. It's just how we got there was quite different. Yes. Or lacking. <laughs> yeah. Draco lives up to his nickname that we gave him of Nazi Von Douchebag II. He tells Pansy and Blaze to leave. Then he, Petrificus Totalis, is Harry. He falls down. His cloak falls off of him. Yes, conveniently. Conveniently. Makes fun of Harry's dead parents, stomps on his face, and then covers him with the cloak. He's just the fucking worst. He is the best at being the fucking worst. He's so traumatized 16-year-old. Oh, for sure. And it's very annoying, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, to say As the least. 16-year-olds can sometimes be. What I think is really interesting here is... The fact that he was able to Petrificus Totalis him through the cloak. That's true, because it's supposed to be impenetrable. Yeah. It so maybe the bottom wasn't there. It warded off other charms. Yeah, it hits off other but charms. But it was specifically Akio in the seventh book. Mm -hmm. They were trying to say Akio cloak. So maybe it's just specific charms like that. Harry says something about charms bouncing off of him, though, when he's wearing it. In the battle, I think? I want to say that's what happens. Which is cool. I don't know. If it is truly Death's Cloak, that would make sense. Because I really did always kind of have the impression that it was impenetrable. But I kind of think it was just impenetrable from detection. Mm, that would make Not sense. Not necessarily spells. So we can't see it with so, Revelio? Yeah. Revelio? Revelio? So <laughs> Revelio. Revelio. <laughs> it's like literally every five seconds. Right? So it would make sense then for Akio to not work because that would lend to... Where it is. Revealing it. Yeah. That would be a spell that would become impenetrable, I think, because it's supposed to be like, you're not supposed to be able to find him in it. If you could Akio a cloak because you know it might be in the vicinity, that kind of defeats the purpose of said cloak. So maybe other spells can't... Like, obviously, Avada Kedavra could go through it. Nothing can block Why that. Why obviously? I don't know. If Petrificus Totalis apparently can. So I yeah. want our Keeper's thoughts on this. Yeah, I do too. Because in my brain, maybe Petrificus Totalis went through like just a little crack in the front. You know, like the seam in the front. He hit the bottom of his shoe. He just <laughs> happened to, to hit it just right. Yeah. And if you hold it up like a blanket in front of you. It protects you. I don't know. Yeah. If it is truly death's cloak, I feel like, you know. He shouldn't have been able to Petrificus Totalis him then, so. I agree with that. 
I am very interested to know what you all think. Not a lot happened people-wise no. in this scene. It was very abbreviated compared to what we got in the book. We already kind of talked about Draco yep, briefly, but yep. again, we get so much better moments. I read something that Tom Felton's screen time totals 28 minutes in the all the movies. Really? And I was like, damn, 28 minutes That's for it? all eight movies? Wow. It's something like that. It's a very low number. I think we should really discuss Tom Felton more when we get into his bigger scene when he gets to crying in the bathroom yeah because that's a good scene honestly he is very he's a very good actor he seems so nice and down to earth too i have his book i'm going to read it one day i think that's going to be one of my 12 books that i read this year we could do a potterheads a history about his book we can do that that would be really fun i'll Mm -hmm. read it too and we can like book club it yes i love that let's do that i mean blaze meh I don't even know who plays Blaze. He's right. very attractive. We could look it up. We'll he look it up. Attractive. And then, of course, Pansy Parkinson. But she doesn't, like, no offense, side They have, actors. like, two lines. Yeah. We're just not going to discuss you, and we're going to go right into the Potter Pondering. Yes, which, we are. as we just decided in this essential moment, because we did not have one planned ahead of time, we really want to know what your thoughts are on the invisibility cloak and whether or not you think Malfoy should have Petrificus totalis him or been able to or yeah, yeah like when it said it was impenetrable is that is just it from being discovered or what so y'all have amazing brains mm-hmm. and we love getting the outside perspective so please let us know find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your responses a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answers. Don't forget you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This week's wizarding word is that some of the names have been revealed for the attractions at Epic Universe in Orlando. So as we discussed on a previous episode, there is a new resort opening up in Orlando. It's universal. It's called Epic Universe, which is going to be opening hopefully summer 2025. So there are 11 names that have been released, and they're mostly centered around the Paris setting and Fantastic Beasts. So excited for that. I know. Because that's like, I really enjoyed, we have talked about this. Both of us really enjoyed the Fantastic Beasts movies, and I'm really sad that we don't get more. But it is what it is. But the first name they released is simply Ministry of Magic. According to the Orlando Park Stop, this is expected to be the name of the overall land. So Epic Universe is going to be naming stuff like how they name Hogsmeade and the Islands of Adventure and Diagon Alley and Universal Studios. This one will simply be named Ministry of Magic. So two of the names are going to be the big attractions or so MuggleNet is speculating. So we have Harry Potter and the Battle at the Ministry, which is expected to be the land's main ride, which is exciting. I think it's going to be kind of like the Transformer type ride. Or the Mummy. That the mum- No, not the Mummy. The Mummy is a little bit more roller coaster esque. Yeah. But like Transformers and like the Shrek rides, the okay. Simpsons rides, okay. how you're like wearing the 3D glasses okay. and you're on a ride, but a lot of it's simulated. Okay. Yeah. And I feel like that's how Gringotts was, but yes. it was a little more roller coastery as well. Whereas the Hogwarts one didn't have the 3D aspect, so that was far more roller coastery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But this one, I think, is supposed to have that more simulation aspect to it. Yeah. So this one is said to be Harry Potter and the Battle at the Ministry. So I wonder if Harry's going to be in it. Since it's Harry Potter and. But it's going to be based in the British Ministry of Magic. They're also going to have Le Cirque Arcanus, which is the Parisian circus featured in Crimes of Grindelwald. And this is going to be a live show. I love that they're going to have more things that aren't just rides because I will be able to convince my husband to go. Yes, it'll be more fun. I keep telling him that he will love these simulation rides. Because the only thing he doesn't like is hills. 
He does not like falling. But the simulation rides don't have hills. They have simulated falls. He's fine with those. We've done tons of those. Yeah. But anyways, they have four food and beverage places that they have released the names of. So there's Café Lair de la Serene. So that and Le Goblet Noir are expected to be quick service restaurants. The Patisserie Madago is going to be a bakery named after creatures that guards the French Ministry of Magic. So a Madago must be the cat. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a bar. It'll be a small bar similar to the Hogshead, but it's called Bar Moonshine. I love it. I love it. Then the last four names that have been filed for are retail services. So there is Tour on Flu, which is expected to be a shop at the exit of Harry Potter and the Battle of the Ministry. Mm. And keeping with the flu network aspect of the ride that will transport visitors from London to Paris. I love that. That's so cute. Oh, that ride, it's totally going to, like, make you feel like it's definitely going to have to have 3D aspects. Oh, yeah. it's going to make you feel like you go flu powdering. Yeah. Flu networking? Flu networking? Flu powdering? Flu flying? Fluing! Fluing! The other one that they have is Les Galeries Mirifique. Mir Mirif yeah, I said it right. Yeah, Mirifique. Mirifique. And this is going to be just another general retail store. Mademoiselle Malkins. <gasps> That's cute. Is going to be a clothing store. Perhaps a subsidiary of Madame Malkin's in Diagonelli. And Cosma à Cajur Baguette Magique will likely be the land's wand shop with Baguette Magique being French translation of the word. It's, <laughs> it's the okay. French translation of the word wand. It's magic bread. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That is, yeah, that's my wand. Absolutely. Let's see. According to Orlando Park Stop, there is also expected to be a candy store named K. Ramel. Oh, caramel. Ha! Ah! Though the patent has not been filed for that yet. So there's going to be lots of attractions, a great hall expansion in the works. So they're going to have dinners hosted like they do at the Warner Brothers Studio in London. So you can go to dinners in the great hall, which will be fun. And there's lots of fun stuff like that. And ooh, they have also announced two hotels that are being constructed in Epic Universe, adding to the eight existing Universal Resort hotels. Ooh. So the Universal Stella Nova Resort will open January 21st, 2025. And the Universal Terra Luna Resort will open February 25th, 2025. So both are themed around planets, stars, and other space phenomenon, which is super cute. So reportedly there's going to be a third hotel, but this has not yet been announced. So lots of cool things coming out about Epic Universe. It sounds like they are trying hard to compete with Disney. Yeah, it really does. We have a link for this that we'll post when the episode comes out. So you can check this stuff out for yourself. It actually has like blueprints for the layout. Oh yeah, and it looks in the cool. article as well. It looks really cool. And now I'm super excited to go back after yeah. 2025. Yeah. So that'll bring us to this week's trivia question, which is what aurors are stationed at Hogwarts when Harry arrives for his 6th year? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag should have been dragons will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at foxsakepod at gmail.com and let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod, We'll get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at ForFoxSakePodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to become a patron, 
You can find us on Patreon at Fox Sake Pod. Patronage starts at $2 and will get you some awesome perks, like for Fox Sake swag, access to our Discord channel, chats, and more. Check out our page for the details. Any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 8, Snape Victorious, and the parallel, but not really corresponding film scenes. They never are. Thanks for listening. Hope you hear us again. I'm Carly. I'm Ellen. And we are... For Fox Fox Sake. Sake.